Good morning. Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of Genesis. We are in a preaching series called The Key Questions in the Bible. There are a lot of questions in the Bible that we can learn from, especially uh, from the answers. And we have talked about the first questions, that is, the first questions recorded in human history, where when God was dealing with Adam and Eve because of their sin, And also that incident with Cain and Abel, we talked about that, because they are early in human history, and they give us a lot of lessons about humankind and who we are. But I want to kind of make a switch in this study to practical questions. And when I say practical questions, what I mean are these are questions that we can use to make decisions by, uh, questions that we can use to grow by, uh, questions and answers that will help us to look into our own lives and to make improvements as improvements need to be made. And one of these questions that we find is an interesting question. It's in the Word of God. It's really a two-part question. And it's found in the book of Genesis in that incident where Hagar, who was a handmaid uh, to Abraham and Sarah, uh, had uh, gone away. And so we're going to look at that that, uh, incident and deal with it. But the question is basically this. Where did you come from? And where are you going? Now that opens up a world of thought. It opens up a category of study. There's several ways we can come to this. First of all, we understand that it is a question that implies that we have a past. It also implies we have a present because we're being asked to think about this. And then we also have a future, where you're going. So it it has to do with our course in life. Now, if I were to come to you and just out of the blue with no incident in the background, not knowing anything about your life right now, and I were to say to you, where did you come from? Well, you'd probably tell me your hometown. Uh, You'd probably tell me your family history. And I'd say, well, where are you going? You'd say, well, I'm going to work or I'm going to church. You think about what's immediately in front of you. But when we ask these questions philosophically, it's a different way of thinking about it. So we want to get into that particular way of viewing it as we look into Genesis chapter 16. Where did you come from and where are you going? Now we come to this narrative, chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, and it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. And Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Now we are visiting a time long ago. We are visiting a culture very ancient, an Eastern culture, an ancient culture. And in those times and in that place, they had uh, a tradition uh, that was socially acceptable and socially uh, performed that if you are married and your wife doesn't have children, that they could be a surrogate, a secondary wife. And if this surrogate was someone who was in the household as a servant, that child could be counted as your own child. And so this was their way of fulfilling the prophecy that God gave them. Now, this is uh, something we must understand right away. This is not God's plan. This was never God's plan. This was outside of the will of God, outside of the plan of God. The plan of God was to test Abram's faith and to have him wait until God in his timing would give him a child with Sarah. And this would be a wonderful work of God because Sarah was long past the age of childbearing. And so this was something that God was going to show them. But they got ahead of God and they did something that was not God's plan. But this was something that was done in those days and it was commonly accepted as something to do. But it wasn't God's plan. All right. So uh, in verse 4, And he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Now what was happening here is Hagar, who was an Egyptian that they had acquired as a servant woman to Sarah. She was her maid. She was her, was Sarah's servant. 
But now that she is with child from Abraham, she is expecting that she's going to have an elevation in status. She's now maybe going to be the lady of the house. Maybe instead of being told what to do, she's going to be the one to tell others what to do. And so this got into her mind, and so she looked at Sarah, and to her, Sarah, who she formerly was submissive to and under subjection to, she now is questioning that arrangement and looking at her with this pride, with this elevated status that she believes she has now had. And of course, this did not sit well with Sarah at all. So notice what happens, that her mistress was despised in her eyes, and Sarah said unto Abraham, uh, Abram, my wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. Now, I could say something like men would say, isn't that just like a woman? You do the exact thing they say to do, and then they end up getting mad at you for doing it. But there is something to this. She is upset, and she's upset with him, because here's part of this what we're going on. You're the one who made this such a big deal. You're the one who made this such a goal. You're the one who made this such a crisis of having an heir. And now, look at the result that has come, and she's thinking he should be the one to fix her. He should be the one to make her straighten up. Now, let's just make some points right away. We're not going to have a big outline today. We're just going to look at the, the situation, and we're going to just draw truth out of it as we go. So let's understand something right away. First of all, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Polygamy is a bad idea. The pastor that I worked under for years had a saying. He said, lives there a man so tough that says one wife is not enough. Well, there's some truth to that. Everywhere where we see polygamy uh, presented in the Bible, it is accompanied by strife, division, conflict, and tragedy. It's just a bad idea. And so we want to get that on record right away. This was not going to work out good. This was a bad idea from the beginning. Secondly, I want to make the point that trying to achieve the good by doing something wrong will result in tragedy every time. The goal that they had may have been a good motive. It may have been a worthy goal, but it was not God's plan. This was pragmatism. It wasn't what God wanted. It was contrary to God's plan, and the end result was, was bad. Now, another thing I want to bring out, even good people can make serious mistakes. Abram was a godly man, a man of faith, a follower of the one true God. Sarah, his wife, was also a follower of the one true God. And yet they made a catastrophically bad mistake. So even good people can make a wrong turn. You look through the Bible and you see the people that God worked with. Listen, a lot of them were pretty flawed, weren't they? Uh, Abram was flawed. Samson was flawed. Moses even flawed. You look at David, he was flawed. All through the Bible, we see people who were very flawed, had real problems, and yet God worked with them. Uh, and so we see that these points need to be made. Uh, the fact that Abraham was so great in faith did not mean that he was incapable of making a blunder, and here he did. Okay, and let's resume our narrative. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, that is with Hagar, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. Now, if you look at where they had started, and if you look at where she was headed, you see that she is headed back to Egypt. She's going home. But it's a dangerous road, especially for a woman all by herself. And so she is so distraught and she is so upset that she is leaving a place of relative safety, although she was made miserable by Sarah's harsh treatment of her, to a place where her life was basically in danger. That's how bad uh, she felt. So we understand this, that she was on her way back to Egypt. 
And so the angel of the Lord, now the angel of the Lord in the Bible is more often than not a reference to a pre-Bethlehem appearance of none other than the Son of God, God the Son, that is the Messiah. So here we have the Son of God, uh, that is the second person of the Trinity, speaking to Hagar, this Egyptian servant. And the angel of the Lord found her, and he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, now notice he, he refers to who she is, her name and her position in life. Whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? Now, when God visits your heart and causes you to think a certain way, he will often use a question. Jesus did this all through uh, his ministry. So, where'd you come from, Hagar? Where'd you come from? Where are you going? So we're going to have a conversation. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to talk about this. And, and so she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. Now that's a very clear answer. Now let's just look at the human reality here. Sarai is basically a queen. Uh, she is the wife of a sheik, uh, if you will. Abraham had a standing army. He was very wealthy. He was somebody. Uh, Sarah had that uh, position. And now she has this servant lady who is now putting on airs and acting as if she were somehow over Sarah, and it just galled her to death. And so Abram didn't want to fool with it. Yeah, you, you deal with her. She, she's your handmaid. You, you, you do what you want to do. And so you, you know what happened, don't you? Two ladies in the same kitchen. Two ladies in the same house. I mean, she, she gave her a hard time. Uh, maybe, maybe she made her do extra work. Maybe she uh, treated her harshly in the way she uh, uh, spoke to her. Uh, I don't know, whatever it was, it was so miserable that she felt she had to leave. Okay? Now, he, she said, I flee from my mistress Sarah, and the angel of the Lord, which we learn is the Lord, okay, said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. Now, I just want you to catch that. This is God talking to Hagar, who's miserable, who left a miserable place. It was so uncomfortable for her, she would rather be in an unsafe road to Egypt than be there. God says, go back. Okay? And he said, submit thyself under her hands. Now, he's not through talking. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered from multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thine affliction. Now here God is speaking to Hagar's heart. God is speaking to Hagar's heart. What do you value, Hagar? What do you want in life what would make you feel like your life has meaning and make you feel like your life has purpose? Now, in that world in which Hagar lived, there was a great deal of talk about descendants. Abraham's descendants would be like the sand of the sea or like the stars of the sky. That was something they valued. That was something they looked for as a blessing from God. And so Hagar also had that same identity, that same feeling that this would be something good. That means you're elevated. That means you have worth. That means you have value. That you would have a legacy. That some good would come from you. And so God is speaking her language. He's speaking a love language to her heart of what you want on the inside. Now understand something. I don't think Hagar asked for any of this. But she was in a place of submission. She was in a place of subjection to those who were over her. And she finds herself in this situation. And the Lord said to her that you're going to have a child because the Lord has heard your affliction. But now he goes on to tell her some other things that maybe aren't as pleasant, but are part of the truth. The part of the truth that she needs to hear. And he will be a wild man. Now, listen, have you ever met a wild man? I've seen some wild men, you know, uh, maybe they weren't like wolves or like bears, but I, I've seen some men who were just kind of on the rough side. I mean, really, he's going to be a rough one, this one. He, he's going to be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. 
So God is telling her what kind of people are going to come from Ishmael. They're going to be a tough bunch. Now, part of God's way of dealing with you is to tell you the good stuff and to tell you the bad stuff. To tell you the positives and to tell you the negatives. This is your life. This is how it's going to be. Yeah, you're going to have a child. He's going to be a tough one. He's going to be a contender. He's going to be a scrapper. And, and this is how his, his descendants are going to be. All right? And she called the name of the Lord that spoke unto her, Listen, thou God seest me. So she recognizes this is God speaking to her. Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Now, she is understanding First, she's all by herself. She's going toward Egypt. She's in a dangerous place. The angel of the Lord appears to her, and she knows this is the Lord. And, and she comes to this understanding, Thou, God, seest me. Now let's grapple with this. When we pray, do we pray and say, Lord, there's a miserable place and I'd sure like you to put me there. No, we don't pray that. We don't say, Lord, there's a certain sickness going around, and I think it's time I caught it. No, we don't pray that way. But now here is the angel of the Lord appearing to her, and he asked, Whence comest thou? Where'd you come from? And where are you going? Now, we could ask this question this way. Have you, have you really thought your plan through? Have you really considered what you're actually doing here? Do you, do you have a, an idea of this path that you've chosen, where it could lead? Do you, do you know what you're doing? That, that's a way of generating a, a little uneasiness. And so she explains what's happening. This is where I came from. I came from a place of misery. I came from a place that upset me. I came from a place where I was treated in such a way that I felt like I had to get out. And what does the Lord say? Go back. Go back. Submit yourself to her. Now here is a fact that we can draw from this narrative. Because it's right there. We can't deny it. And it's, it's a fact that sometimes will affect you and affect me. God just may not change your circumstances. Even if you want Him to. He just might not. God may not change your circumstances. He may not improve your social status. He may not improve your economic situation. He may not improve your degree of health or areas of conflict. He may not decrease your number of hardships. In fact, even though he sees, and even though he cares, his will for you might be to stay right there in that spot you're in that you wish you weren't in. You stay there. You work it out. Now, sometimes God in his wonderful grace will make a change in your life. He took the children of Israel after 400 plus years as bond servants in Egypt, and he delivered them. But Let's don't miss the point that for 400 plus years, the Israelites were born, lived, and died, born, lived, and died, born, lived, and died, born, lived, and died, generation after generation as slaves, praying for deliverance and not getting it. Jesus, when he was here, he said that others prayed for what you are seeing now, and they didn't get to see it. You're getting to see it, but they didn't get to see it. You say, well, life sure seems unfair. Yep. But eternity is fair. But this life, don't count on it being fair. How many times have I seen a very intelligent, smart, wise woman get married to an idiot? Oh, she fell in love which is a kind of a form of temporary insanity. But that's why marriages happen more often than not. They fall in love. And so the good points 
are large and easy to see. The bad points are so microscopically small that they don't see them at all, even though everybody else sees them plainly. And life's unfair. Here is a woman who has all the brains and all the intelligence and all the wisdom that could have brought her to a great place, and yet she is committed in love and in marriage to a man who will never make good decisions, who's not that bright, and to tell you truly, uh, that, that somebody ought to give him a good talking to. Life's unfair. And sometimes I've seen it happen that somebody will be in a job or in a workplace, and he will have the best idea anybody came up with. The best idea. The winning idea. The idea that if it were implemented would have improved the situation in that business or in that, uh, that outfit uh, exponentially. And yet, because he wasn't of the type of person that others looked at as being one of the guys and, you know, the in-charge kind of guy, the macho uh, alpha male, they just said, eh, and they dismissed his idea. And he said, oh, okay. And then some other fellow who had all the machismo and all the charm and all the leadership ability implemented an idea that was disastrously bad. Life's unfair, isn't it? How many times did the worst candidate get elected? And the better candidate, not. Life's unfair sometimes. How many times did somebody commit a crime, and because he had a really good lawyer and a really not-so-good jury, he got away with it scot-free, and another fellow who did a comparatively smaller crime got a tough judge and a mean-spirited ju uh, jury, and he got the book thrown at him for something that may maybe wasn't that big a deal. Life's unfair. Was it fair that Hagar had to be treated so badly by Sarah that she felt like she had to leave? No, that wasn't fair. That wasn't fair. Now, maybe she could have improved her attitude, and I think that's what's going on here. You see, there's a little implication here. <laughs> you go back, you go back, but what does he say? Submit to her. You go back, but leave your pride out of it. You go back but quit putting on airs. You go back, but don't expect to be the primary wife. You go back and be Hagar, the handmaid, who's going to have a child, and I'm going to bless that child. Go be yourself, because I'm not going to elevate you. I'm not going to put you over Sarah. I'm not, I'm not going to change your... Listen, sometimes it's tough to hear disappointing news from God. Have you ever prayed to God for something, and He didn't give it to you? I have. Now, you've got a choice to make now, don't you? You can get angry and disappointed with God, or you can say, let God be God. Sometimes He does answer my prayers the way I wish He, he would. Other times, He does not. He's still God. Listen, it is God who gives children. It is God who withholds. We don't understand it, and we'll never understand it this side of glory. But here we have that God may not change your circumstances. He may not make you healthy. He may not make you wealthy. Understand that. Also, God's best plan for you may be for you to learn to appreciate the situation you already have. His best plan for you may be to change your attitude, not your altitude. His best plan for you may be for you to change the way you think. And next, here it is. God always has a bigger plan going on. Now, when God was speaking to Hagar, he said, yes, you're going to have a baby. Okay, she, she kind of knew that was coming, but she, it would be a boy. He's going to be called Ishmael. He's going to be a wild man. His, his uh, ancestors, I mean, his descendants, rather, are going to be contentious. That's going to the way they're going to go. So now she knows there's, there's a bigger plan here. There's a bigger plan. God's making people. He's making tribes. He's making nations. That's all God's plan. Listen. Even though it was a mistake what Abram and Sarah did, God incorporate. listen, here's, here's, here's one of the mysteries we got to understand. God incorporates your mistakes into His overall plan. If God can't do that, He's not God. If God doesn't do that, that means what happened? Okay, did God say, whoa, I didn't see that coming. What am I going to do now? Listen, there's never a time in the history of the throne room of God where God smacked himself in the forehead and said, I didn't see that coming. God knows everything in advance. 
And He's already got plans for it. He's already got a, a solution for everything that we do, even those things that were outside of His plan. So, God has a bigger plan going on than you know. Your part is more valuable than you know. Let's say you taught five-year-olds in Sunday school, and you studied hard, and you poured yourself into that class, and you loved those little children, and you, you talked about Jesus, and you talked about the Bible, and you told the stories as best you could to interest them. You have no idea what impact that has on eternity. You have no idea. Some of them will accept it. Some of them will reject it. But you never know what seed you planted will pop up later. You just never know. All the things we do, every sermon, every Sunday school lesson, every witness, every love, bit of love that we show another person, that has more ramifications than we could possibly know. God has a bigger plan, and your life is more valuable than you could ever know. Now, notice this is God talking. This is God engaging Hagar in the process. He reveals to her what will be so that she'll have more patience with what is. And that's what God does for us through His Word. Listen, the reason Christians have an edge, the reason Christians have the ability to have joy and to have uh, hope and, and to have purpose in life is because we've been told something about the future that the world doesn't know unless they have studied God's Word and, and believed it. We know that this world is temporary, here today and gone tomorrow. There's another better place coming yet, and this is just a proving ground or a testing ground for that. Therefore, we need to trust God and hope for better times to come. That's a better way to live than we're here for a while and then we die and we're dead like a dog. We have a better plan. We have a better sense of the future. So God is dealing with her so that she will have faith to deal with her present situation. And this is true for all of us. Now, let's just bring some applications. Let's bring it to our heart. Let's look at, at you and me, all right? The first part of the question, uh, where'd you come from? Where'd you come from? Ask yourself, what is my personal history? What experiences have brought me to where I am now? What factors from my past must I acknowledge in order to cultivate a better attitude and a better course of actions? Where'd you come from? Now, I look at my life, you look at your life, you look at our history. Who were your parents? Who were your grandparents? Who were your people? What cultural things have stuck with you? You realize we're all born into a culture? One kind of culture or another. The things you learn by the time you're five years old are basically the things you're going to know the rest of your life. Your culture, how to look at the world, how to look at yourself. What do you value? What's important? Uh, what do you feel about this or that or the other? Uh, the, these things are, are things that, that are our past. Where'd you come from? What are your roots? And we all have that. We all have to do it. And listen, some of it's good and some of it's not good. We need to always be honest critics of our own culture. We can criticize other cultures more easily than we can often criticize our own culture. Isn't that true? But listen, there are things about your own culture that maybe you ought to review and look at and say, huh, is that right? Is that godly? Is that good? Is that consistent with Scripture? Is that something I need to look at through the light of Scripture and, and maybe even condemn as wrong? So where did you come from? That's important to know. What has led you to this point? Now, we can look at that philosophically, we can look at it politically, we can look at it personally, but it's all the same concept as this. Where did I come from? And secondly, uh, as it, where are you going? What's your trajectory? What's your plan? Uh, wh where would you like to be five years from now? Uh, wh what, what is it going to take to get there? Now, there are times in which we can make decisions now that we'll thank ourselves for later. But we can make decisions now that will also make us regret those decisions later. This is the type of thinking that the Bible is asking us to do. What decisions are you making right now that will determine your future? What could you do right now that would make your future better? Better than your past? better than your present, 
better than it would have been had you not made that thought process. That's the idea. Where are you going? Now, I think about this uh, politically, for example. What, what lessons could our country learn from its past? Uh, what worked? What didn't work? Uh, what was a good thing that we ought to re-examine and say, you know, that was good. We should do that again. What did we do that didn't work and was bad? We should look at it and say, well, maybe we shouldn't do that again. These are just good, healthy questions that anybody ought to ask as a citizen and as a leader in the country. Also, let's apply it personally and, and say that this is also applying it profitably. What has brought me to this present state? And, and here's what a list of things there are. There's things you inherited you didn't provide it. It was provided for you. It could be material things. It could be attitudes. It could be uh, conditions. It could be habits. Uh, this was just, you just landed there and there you are. All right. And there's the things that other people did to you or for you. You, you know, one thing's for sure. If you ever come across a turtle on a fence post, you know one thing right away. That turtle didn't get there by himself. Now that is how you and I are. There, there are some things about us that we didn't get there by ourselves. Somebody helped us get there. That's important to apply and understand. So there's that, that, that idea, what you inherited, what somebody did for you. And there's also the things that you did because you made up your mind to do them. And it was up to you and you did it. And some of them were mistakes you made. Some of them were good decisions you made. Listen, if you applied yourself to a trade and you learned that trade and you applied that trade and you were able to uh, make a good wage because you applied yourself to that, you're now benefiting uh, the blessings of that work that you yourself put in. And listen, here's what I'm going to say, and I believe it's true. I believe it's true universally. The more of where you are depends on what you personally do, the better off you're going to be. Because even if you inherit a lot of good things, if you don't personally discipline yourself and personally train yourself and personally build your own character, you can lose everything that was handed to you on a silver platter or be miserable even in a golden cage. The best part of life are the things that with God's help, you're able to do by making wise decisions your own self and not blame others with it. Listen, there comes a time when you've got to quit blaming other people for why you're messed up. You need to quit blaming other people for why you're not happy. Quit blaming other people for why you're not successful. What decisions you make are the most important things there are, and the others don't matter anyway. You've got no control over that. So, where am I going? What changes should I make to end up where I should be? And when should I make them? Now, if you wake up one morning and find out that you're on the wrong path, how long should it be that you get on the right path? A couple of years, 10 years? Oh, you should put on the counter, 10 years from now, I'm going to get on the right path. Now, listen, when you, when, you, when you realize this is the wrong path, the thing to do is to trust God and seek His counsel, and if you can do it, and it's in His will, make a change. Look at it different. Do something. So this is what happened with Hagar. God saw her. She said, He sees me. Now, God sees and cares about you, but He may or may not change your circumstances. God sees and cares about you, but he just may not improve your standing. God sees and cares about you, but he may or may not remove your personal pain. How many of those truly, who truly and faithfully followed God in the Bible could you really look at their lives and say, boy, they were happy people? Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. David, I think, had a life of great purpose, a life of great meaning, but, you know, the, the, he was happy at times, but other times he had problems. You read through the Psalms, man, he had problems, big problems. You look, you look at the people that God used, they weren't always happy, and smiling all the time, giddy with joy. They struggled, but their life had meaning, and they had the inner joy of knowing that they were serving God. God cares about you. 
but he may not remove your problems from you. Life will have its share of troubles, hardship, and suffering. Now let's apply this and understand about Hagar's heart. I just want to bring this part of it in because it's something that I think we we need to grapple with. God spoke to Hagar in the area of her deepest pain. What she was feeling is, is this word, and I believe you can see it when I say it. She was feeling humiliated. That's how she felt. Pushed down. Insulted. Humiliated. That was an emotional pain that she had. She felt like her life was viewed by others as small and insignificant. She desired to feel important. She desired to have some status. Now, whether or not it was just foolish, sinful pride, or whether or not it was the normal human ego that you and I may understand all too well, she had a normal response to a situation, a normal human response, flawed as it may be. Sarah did not like the new status that Hagar thought to assume, and so there was great conflict. And so her plan was to humble her and put her back in her place. It was ego and wounded pride that made Hagar leave that place and get on the dangerous road back to Egypt where she may have died along the way. Think about it. She just wanted what other people wanted. She wanted what other people had, or at least what she viewed that they had. I don't fault her too much. This is normal. This is human. This is how people are. It was wrong to be proud, but aren't we all proud? It was wrong to be led by her ego, but aren't we all sometimes led by our ego? Even the best of us, even the people that served God the most had an ego they had to deal with. God assured Hagar, you're going to be okay. Your life has meaning. You're going to have a son. That son is going to become famous. He's going to have a lot of children. They're going to be a tribe of their own. They're going to be tough customers, but they'll be there, and there'll be a lot of them. And that made her feel important. There's there's some people who are going to come from me. There's, There's descendants that are going to come from me. That was something she valued, and that was something that God told her she was going to have. Now listen, you know what this tells me about God? He cares about what you care about. He cares about you where you are. My little little son had a, when he was small, had a lizard friend. Called him his little friend. Just a lizard. You know how they are. They have that neck thing that pooches out like that. And it was his little friend. And he played with his friend, a little lizard. He'd hold it and make it walk in the air. He loved, he, he loved that little pet of his. One day, something happened, that little lizard died. And he was so sad. And you know what? To me, lizards are nothing. The bushes are crawling with them in Alabama. They're everywhere. One dead lizard doesn't cause me great emotional pain. If I saw a dead lizard, I'm not going to get out on the ground and shed a tear. It's just a lizard. Doesn't mean anything to me. But I tell you what, that lizard meant a lot to my little boy. And when that lizard died, I got sad. I got sad for him, and I saw his tears, and it made me want to shed tears too. And, you know, I felt like getting down on my knees with my boy right then and praying, Lord, if there's a lizard heaven, please help this lizard to get in lizard heaven. Even though theologically I know it's absurd and no, it has no basis whatsoever. But I hurt. Why? Because he hurt. I cared because he cared. Maybe it was childish. Maybe it was something that, you know, in the overall scheme of things, it didn't really matter a lot. God's our Father. He's our Father. That's the word He uses to describe Himself to us. He's our Father. He cared about Hagar. So much so 
that God appeared personally to her in the form of the angel of the Lord and talked to this servant woman about her body and about her descendants and about her feelings and about the value of her life. He's your father too. And he cares about you. Now, if you've never been saved, here's what the Bible says about that. Let's ask the question, where are you going? John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Romans 5, verse 12 says this, Wherefore, as one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Where are you going? Romans 5, 12 tells us, here's where you're going if you've only been born once. If you've been born once, you've been born into this world as a sinner, and you have death to look forward to, and then punishment past that. The lake of fire the Bible talks about. That's where you're going. The same Bible that says if you're born once, then you die, and you die again. You die twice. says that if you're born again, you only die once. And then you live forever in heaven. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, the Bible says. So here it is. Let's apply it spiritually. God is asking you now, where are you going? And God's will for you is that He be your Father. And He love you and see you and care for you and give your life purpose and meaning past your understanding to help you cope with the stuff you're going to go through because you're going to go through some. To help you do with the situations you're in because you may find yourself in some situations and give you hope of eternal life. Dear Father, we thank you that our life is bigger than we realize, that we have more purpose than we know. We thank you that you care enough to speak to us where we live in our hearts. Lord, we thank you for the tender, loving care you gave to Hagar, which expresses to us just what kind of God you really are, a wonderful, tender, compassionate, loving, caring God, Lord, who wants us to have a better attitude about our lives, that wants us to have a sense of purpose, that wants to be able to correct us when our thinking hurts us and brings us to a place that's not healthy for us. Lord, I pray that we would be submissive to your will, that we would occupy the space that you have placed us in with joy and with thankfulness. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.